we kind of got series going on both services Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Sunday morning we're doing every chapter we're taking something from the book of Acts and uh, then we started a series last Wednesday night on uh, the seven unities. We talked about seven unities uh, in, in the church and we talked about this in light of the fact that not that there's disunity in the church but from the standpoint that uh, there are things that unify us. Amen. In other words, when we, when we talk about unity in the church, have you been around church very much automatically when somebody says, we're going to talk about unity? We are so conditioned in our world today for troubles and problems that we always go, I wonder what's going on. I wonder what's going on. There's nothing going on. There's nothing going on. Because we're not talking about it from the things, from unity, from the standpoint of division. But we're talking about the things we have in common. What makes us strong is what we have in common. That's what makes a church great. Is what, what, what makes us great is, is not just so much that we believe the same thing, but it's, it's when we can understand that there are unities in the Spirit that we have in common. And, and so that's what we're uh, teaching about because I, I like to think that we as a local church, and when we talk about the body of Christ in this series, as we mentioned last week, that we're talking about our local church. Okay, that's who we are, this is who we're responsible for. Uh, uh, I'm not responsible for anybody's church outside of this one. This, this is our responsibility. It's just like it's your home. It's not your responsibility what somebody does in theirs. It's your home that you have to be responsible. This is our church. We have to be responsible. And, and I think that if we can understand what true spiritual unity is, then uh, we will we'll be stronger within ourselves and, uh, and make us stronger inside the church. Everybody said amen. Hope that made sense. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're taking our lessons from. We appreciate you all being here tonight. It's Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday night before the 4th of July. And uh, we're thankful for the privilege to live in America. As big a mess as she's in, it's still, you know, it's still my favorite place to live. And I'm going to say something else, and I'm kind of partial to southwest Missouri. Uh, as crazy as the world is in the United States, there ain't a better place to have to endure the craziness than here in southwest Missouri. I'd rather live here than any place in this great country. If I thought there was a better place, better place to live, I would be pursuing a way to get there. But this is where I want to live. Amen. Everybody said, praise the Lord. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Then he describes the unity of the Spirit. There's one body, one Spirit, even as you are called in the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Amen. Everybody said praise the Lord. Amen. Unity of the Spirit. You may be seated. Notice here he didn't say unity in opinions and, and unities in likes and dislikes, but he talked about it and he described it as being in the unity of the Spirit. Because we are a, uh, we are a unique creature when we are a part of the body of Christ. The Bible says, and we covered this last week, that we're a part of the body of Christ. Christ is the head and we are the body. Even though we have many members, we're still one body. You know, we're just not a giant finger. We're just not a giant heart. We're not just a giant liver. We're, but we as a human body, and he uses the analogy there, describes us that we are many members, but we make up one body. And so when we talk about the body of Christ, for our point of discussion or for our area of discussion tonight, we're talking about our church. So last week we introduced the first two unities of the uh, church that there was. We talked about there was one body, meaning that no one 
operates independently without the other. I need you, you need me. What you have to offer, I might not have to offer. What you can do, I might not be able to do. Uh, but what I can do, you might not be able to do. But when we all make it work together, when you do what I, you can do and I do what I can do, when we come to church and we gather together and we worship and we pray and we sing, we preach, we teach, we do what we do, then it all works together. And when we leave here, we, we can testify that it's been good for us to have been together in the house of the Lord because we are one body. And when we work that, because no one operates successfully outside the body of Christ because he, the body of Christ because he is the head and we are the members. And then we talked about, and I'm just bringing everybody up to speed, there's one body and one spirit. Now, when he talk about the one spirit, we, we understand that there is, a, there is the spirit of the Holy Ghost. We understand that, that God is a spirit. No man has seen God. But in the sense that Paul is talking about, he's not talking about the spirit of God. But he's talking about the spirit that we have that drives us, that pushes us. Last week we described it, that every human being has to have a passion. Some of the most unfulfilled lives are people who had nothing to do, nothing to drive them, nothing to cause them to want to get up and do something. Everybody needs something to do. We mentioned it last week how that Dr. James Dobson, with that that. Uh, world-renowned child psychologist, he said one time, and I remember when our children were little and we tried to focus on that uh, 40 years ago, that he, he said that everybody's, every child and every individual needs one thing in life that they can do. Amen. They just need one thing. They don't need 15 things, but they need one thing that they can do. And if you can teach them or drive them or bend them and shape them into that one thing that they like. That's, there's a scripture that goes along with that that says that we should train up a child in the way that it should go. And that don't just mean teaching it right from wrong. That's given. But we should train up a child in the way that the Lord has bent that child or shaped that child. There are some people who, who, are, who are gifted, for example, in music, but the parents aren't gifted in music. And they, the parents get frustrated sometimes because the child wants to do music and the parents don't like music. But we should train them in the way that they should go. If they have a gift for music, let them play music, but we train them to go with their gift in a godly way. And so we, we understand that. But there, in the human realm, there is a thing called passion. And the soul of, of man never dies. But the body parts get old and weak and feeble and they die. And, but, but everyone has to have a passion. Something that drives them. Something that pushes them. Something they like to do. That they pour themselves into. And the spirit is supposed to have one, one spirit. The church is supposed to have one spirit or one passion. One passion that drives us. There, there's a reason why we come on Wednesday night. There's a reason why that after we've worked all day and we've worked half of the week and the world calls it hump day. How that, that, that the week is, now we're headed towards the weekend. Thank God for the weekend. And we head for the weekend because we've made it through Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday's in that middle and we head for the weekend. There's a reason why there's something that, that gets a hold of people that love God that push us that there's a spirit or a passion that that takes us and pushes us to where we're willing after all week of working as we start down the hill we, we decide we're going to get around after supper and get the kids ready and everybody and we just come on to church there's a reason for that there's a passion well it's because we don't want the pastor to think we don't care if the pastor wasn't going to be I don't know the pastor it ain't about the pastor that if you have pastor passion then you've got the wrong kind of passion if the only reason you live the way you do is to please the pastor and the only reason you come to church is just to make the pastor feel like you're trying then then you got it all wrong you got the wrong passion because pastors can come and go even though we've been here a long time and I hope we get to stay a while but the, but it's been it's not that that's not our passion our passion has to be as we said last week where Paul stated it when he said oh that I might know him 
I want to know God. That has to be the passion of the body. That has to be the passion of Christ. I want to know Him in the power of His resurrection, in the fellowship of His suffering. I want to know Him. And that's why we come to church on Wednesday night. That's why we come to church on Sunday. Is because we honestly, deep down, have to have a passion about the things of God that says, I just want to know Him. I want to know Him. I'm not here to get. I'm here to know. Amen. I'm here to know. I'm here to know. I want to know Him. That ought to be our passion. That ought to be everybody's desire is that we might know more about Him. More of Jesus, let me learn. The old old hymn used to sing. Let me know more about His ways and His concepts and everything else. But there has to be, the church has to have, when a church loses its passion, It's not his passion for souls, and it's not his passion for mission, it's not his passion for the building. But when we lose our passion to know God, that's when we become stagnant, that's when we become mechanical, that's when we become ritualistic. But as long as we can have a passion to know him, to know him, to know him, amen, we will will make it a point because we might... Miss something on a Wednesday. You say, miss something on a Wednesday night? Yeah, we may miss a concept or a precept or, or a, an ex, a experience on a Wednesday night that would cause us to not know Him. Well, I know Him. I know Him. Really? You're a unique person if you really know all there is to know about God and you know Him in His fullness. But we want to know Him. There ought to be a passion that pushes us. So Paul said that, he said, We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. There is one body and one Spirit. One body and one Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope. One hope of your calling. One hope. Say one hope. So we've had one body, one Spirit, and now we have one hope, which is the one hope of your calling. Notice here, Paul started this out by saying that we should walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And he said, since you've been called and you're trying to walk worthy of that vocation or that position that Christ has put you in as a member of the body, and now you've got to walk. If you're going to be a finger, be the best finger. If you're going to be the nose, be the best nose. If you're going to be a foot, be the best foot. If you're going to be a, an inner inner organ, then be the best inner organ that you can be. And, and so he is saying to walk worthy of that because he said he, of that calling, that position. But he said you need to understand that, that your calling brings with it a hope. It brings the hope of your calling, the hope of your calling. So there's a couple things tonight about, about the hope of our calling that I want to talk about. I want to talk about, first of all, the nature, the nature of the hope of our calling. Amen. Here, as, as in Colossians 1 and 5, I believe it is, in Titus 2 and 13, it talks about that, that our hope is of things not seen. Uh, here it's not the thing that is hoped for, but here what he's talking about, I believe, is the emotion of our hope. The emotion of our hope. The church should have an emotion about it that... See, we we believe there's one body, and we believe we all got this spirit to know Him, but we all should have one hope that brings a certain emotion to it. You know, if you've got uh, two or three children at home, if one child, you know, one child at home on Christmas Eve can change the whole emotion of the household. You don't have to have ten kids on Christmas Eve to have the household get excited. Just have one. Because they've, they, they've known for months that, that Christmas Eve is coming. And, and on Christmas Eve they get excited. And, and the whole atmosphere changes inside the home. Because tomorrow is going to be Christmas. And, and tomorrow is, uh, is the day we have anticipated for. And they start getting ready for it. I can remember as a kid they used to send out those little Christmas catalogs. And we would go through. Anybody remember those? They started calling them wish books. And we'd go, I want this and I want that and we want this. And my folks was poor 
harvest Job's turkeys, and they just go, okay, okay, you can want what you want, but what you're going to get might not be in there, but we'd get those J.C. Penney's and Alden's and Montgomery Ward's and Sears and Roebuck, and we'd fan through those, and I want this, and I'd take a pencil, and I'd mark it, that's what I want, and then by the time we'd get those in October, by the next month, we didn't want those things, and sometimes mom and dad would get what we said we wanted earlier, and by the time Christmas got there, we'd lost interest in that. <laughs> How many's ever had that with your own children? You buy them something and they look at it and then they, you say, well, you said that's what you wanted. Yeah, but that was three days ago. You know, it changes. Now, you ever, anybody understand what I'm talking about? But there's an excitement that comes when hope is, when there's something you're hoping to receive. And the church needs to have, there ought to be a hope that changes and brings about emotion. The hope that we have ought to make us emotional. Amen. It's the expectation of future good. All of the believers, all church, should have the same aspiration and, and the same anticipation of, of coming glory. I don't understand. I'll be real truthful about it. I don't understand how somebody who got in church to keep from going to hell. I got in church... Not for a job or a car. I had a good job. I was driving a new car. I had everything going. I had money in my pocket. I didn't get in church to get a job. I didn't get in church to get a car. I got full of the Holy Ghost for one simple reason. I was scared I was going to a devil's hell. And the last place this old boy wanted to go was to hell. And I got out of the world and got into the church for the simple... You say, well, I got in it for a lot of... I got in it because I didn't want to go to hell. I'll be real honest with you. I got it. I was scared out of my mind that if I died, I was 19 years old, but I was scared. And, and, and we've lost that. We've, we've preached against preaching against hell, but hell is just as real. If you don't go to heaven, you're going to hell. It's a cut and dried matter. There's no purgatory. There's no bouncing around. And there's not, not my opinion or anybody else's opinion. It's what does thus saith the Lord. He's going to separate them to the left or the right. And he's going to either enter in or depart from me. It's real simple. We're either going to heaven or hell. And I got into this thing because I wanted to go to heaven. I was scared out of my mind that I was going to be killed. I was going to die. Something was going to happen. The Lord was going to come back. And I was was going to wake up and realize I had missed it and I had no hope. I don't know if anybody else ever felt that way or not. But when you get to feeling that way, you'll, you'll get the Holy Ghost. You don't have to, nobody going to beg you or slap you around or scare you or talk you into that. If you think you're going to go to hell this week, you'll get the Holy Ghost tonight. I don't really want to get baptized. If you think you're going to hell if you don't get baptized, you'll jump in that water now. You don't care. Yes, yeah, don't send me to hell. Don't send me where the Bible says it's total outer darkness with a, with a lake of fire and it's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and a place where the worm or the soul never dies. And all i got to do, the only thing I can do according to Scripture is look up and see heaven. How do you know that? Because the thing about hell is going to be that I can see heaven. If I go to hell, I'm going to see heaven. Because the Bible says that the rich man who was in hell lifted up his eyes and saw Lazarus up, up there. In, the, in that paradise place he can see it so all of hell if I go to hell I'm going to watch you shouting and dancing up there and I'm going to see you getting all your rewards and your, you won't be able to see me but according to scripture he lifted up his eyes in hell and saw Lazarus in, in the place of paradise so hell's going to watch us if we're in heaven you tell me that you're not scared to go to a place like that I'll do anything I got to do to keep from going to a place like that I'll look anyway, talk anyway, I'll go where I gotta go. I just don't let me go to hell. And you tell me how you can get delivered from that. How you can be promised by God. You don't have to go to hell. You can rise to walk in a newness of life. And you can have the same spirit that raised Christ can lift up your mortal body and send you to heaven and you not get excited about it. 
Yeah, I'm ready to go to heaven. Well, what's the big deal of heaven? I'll tell you what the big deal of heaven is. It ain't hell. <laughs> All we're going to do is just stand around and praise the Lord. Yeah, because we're not in hell. <laughs> It's just going to be one big old praise service up there. Yeah, you know what we're praising about? Because we ain't in hell. Yes. What we're going to do is get a new robe and they're going to give you a crown you're going to cast at his feet. Yeah, because we ain't in hell. I'm sorry, but, but going to heaven gets me excited because I ain't going to hell. And I'm going somewhere and I want to go to heaven. And that the church should have an emotion about it because we're heaven bound. We're heaven bound. We, that, that's the nature of the hope of our calling. The hope of our calling should create an emotion in us. All believers should have that same aspiration, that same anticipation of coming glory. Amen, because we got the Holy Ghost. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. The second thing about our, the, the hope, the, the hope of our calling, the oneness of the hope of our calling, is it's the hope of your calling. It's its, it's origin. It's origin. It, where does it come from? It comes out of the effectual call of the Holy Ghost or the Spirit that's on the inside of us who begets us, as Peter said, that he causes us to become lively stones. Lively stones. Part of the temple built up. We're lively stones. All right, let's just use our imagination. Let's just use our imagination. Lively stones. Jumping beans. Anybody remember those things? You could order them off the back of comic books when I was a kid. Those Mexican jumping beans. Remember those? And they'd pop, 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 pop. Lively stones. What if we were a temple of the Holy Ghost made up of lively stones? Amen. Because of the one thing that, that makes us lively is that spirit that's on the inside of us. Because the spirit of the Lord is not dead. It's not emotionless. It's not, it's not passionless. But the Spirit of the Lord is... I don't believe... You know, we read the first chapter of the book of the Bible and we go... And God said, let there be light. I don't think that's how he said it. God just steps out on the portals of glory and goes, let there be light. That's how we read it. And I believe that he said it with some passion. Let there be light. He spoke it because, because everything he does is passionate. And then he says, I'm going to put my spirit in you, and I'm going to make you a part of the building, and you're going to be a lively stone. A lively stone. We're afraid of becoming lively. We shouldn't be afraid of becoming lively because it, it springs out of that's our calling. That's who we are. We are a lively stone. He is himself, that spirit that on the inside of us. He's twofold. He's the earnest of our inheritance and he's the seal. That's what keeps us. He's the, he's the earnest and the seal of our future inheritance. We've got that on the inside of us. You know what an earnest is. When somebody says that's the earnest of your inheritance, it's like an earnest money. It's like earnest money. The Holy Ghost is not the total package. The Holy Ghost, that's just enough to get you there. The Holy Ghost... <laughs> That's what it is. It's the earnest of it. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you say, well, I got full salvation. Yeah, you did, but you didn't get, you didn't get full redemption. But when you receive the Holy Ghost, that's like, that's like me when I buy a house. Brother, I give an earnest money. I put $1,000 down for an earnest money. You know what that does? That holds it for me. But I don't get to live in the house just because I put some earnest money in. But I got to wait until we close. 
When I close my eyes in death or the Lord comes back, for to be absent in the body is to be present with Christ. When I leave this earth and I step over into the portals of glory and I realize I'm there, that's when I have full redemption and full salvation. That's what the Holy Ghost is, my earnest money. It holds me, it keeps me, it delivers me, it gets me excited, it gets me all of these things. It delivers me, it helps me, it heals me, it does all of these things, but it's not the end of the deal. That just holds me until I get there. And it's a seal. The Bible talks about it sealing us until that day of redemption. It keeps me. A seal keeps me. It keeps me. It protects me. It watches over me. It... Oh. We naturally hope for what we have been invited to receive. If I was to tell you Everybody here is invited to my house Sunday. You're not, but if I said this. <laughs> my wife looked at me like, no. <laughs> hey, Saturday's the 4th of July. Everybody show up about 6 o'clock. We're cooking ribs. We've got ribs, and we've got coleslaw, and we've got potato salad and baked beans, and we've got corn on the cob, and we've got big jugs of tea. We've got all kinds of homemade ice cream, and, and you've got to join us because if you don't come and eat it, it's all going to be a waste. And, and, and if you would, I would hate to think that you would be sitting here going, well, we've got to go to Pastor's house and eat ribs. We better eat something on the way just in case they're not real good. I'd like to think that you would anticipate coming over there and having some ribs and potato salad and some coleslaw and that homemade ice cream. I'd, I, then We ought to be excited about, we hope for, that we are invited to receive. And the Lord has said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you'll be also. He said, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told you that. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. That's why we, that's the hope of our calling. We got called to be lively stones. But I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I'm going, and it gets me excited because I read about what's there. I hope this is making sense. The hope of our calling, the one hope of our calling, it, it, it has an effect. It has its effect as, you know what it does for the church, the church having this hope of our calling. It's like back in the days when they were bringing over the immigrants from the other countries. If two men, use your imagination, they're bringing this big ship, and two men meet on the ship, and they're on their way here from Italy. And they meet on there and they look at one another and they say, where are you going? I'm going to America. What are you going to America for? Because I've heard there's, there's job opportunities. That's where I'm going. That's why I'm going. What do you want to be? I want to be a welder. I want to be a welder too. I wonder what we're going to do when we get there. And they begin to talk about it. You know what that does? Because they all, both of those guys have the same goal, the same hope, the same dreams. It, it brings them into that position of unity. You know what joins the church together is the hope of our calling. The effect of the hope of our calling. We might not all like the same things on this earth. You might not like fried potatoes. You might like yours boiled. You might like yours mashed. I may like mine in hash browns. You might not like your bacon real crispy. You might like it a little bit salt. But it don't make any difference what style ribs you like on the 4th of July. All I'm telling you is that's not why we're here. That's not what binds us together. You know what binds us together in this place tonight? It's because we all got one hope. And that's a call to street of gold. That's called a mansion. That's called a, a new body, a new life. It's called the hope of glory. It's because we're all going to heaven. Wouldn't it be just a miserable, miserable life if soon as you got the Holy Ghost, you all started, we all started liking the same kind of car. They all started liking 
the same kind of color and the same. You know what? I'll tell you what. When I got the Holy Ghost, you know what I had? I had one thing in common. I had a whole bunch of things. But the main thing that drove the church was to know the Lord. But the thing that got us all excited, we all had one hope of our calling. And that was one of these days Jesus was going to step out on the clouds and say, come up a little bit higher. And in the instant, in the twinkling of an eye, we was going to feel a change in our bodies. And we was going to rise to meet him in the air. Those that are dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we're going to rise to meet him in the air that's what keeps us excited because it ain't all about this but what makes us unified is that we've got a hope together and my hope is your hope amen oh man praise the lord i feel like i'm having church tonight amen there's Endeavoring to keep the spirit of the body of Christ, there's one body, one spirit, as you are called, even one hope of your calling. One Lord. Say one Lord. I found this very interesting that we, uh, we as oneness people, we believe in one God. We believe that there's one God who manifested himself as Father in creation and Son and redemption and Holy Ghost. Amen? Ain't that what we believe? One God? Three manifestations? Father in creation, Son in redemption, and the Holy Ghost in regeneration. That's, that's what we believe. That's what we believe. Paul said there's one Lord. Okay, but there's got to be something about the one Lord that binds us together. And it's just not the teaching of the one Lord. It's not the Godhead. I don't believe that's what Paul is talking about here when he talks about, <clears throat> when he talks about the Lord well, having one Lord. But I believe what he's talking about because he's talking about, when you put it in context here, he's talking about unities. Unity, say unities. The thing that makes the body cohesive is the fact that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, and one Lord. That means that we all, he's not now, now don't misunderstand this. I believe in the oneness of the Godhead, but that's not what he's talking. I don't believe that's what he's talking about. He's, cause he's talking about endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. And he said to do that, we have to have one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, and one Lord. That means we all have to serve the same God. There has to be don't leave here and say, Pastor says he don't believe. I didn't say I didn't believe in one God. I said that's not the context that Paul was talking about. Because you see, as the head of the church, the, he is the supreme object of our faith, and it's his name that we're baptized in. Amen. I said he's the head of the church. He's the supreme object of our faith. And that's why when we baptize you, we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. But there's two ideas that are involved when it comes to him saying there's one Lord here. And the first thing is when Paul said there's one Lord, the first thing I believe he's talking about is ownership. Ain't nobody or nothing can be owned with, by two. We're not only, he's not, we are his. We have to understand that. We are his. Not only is he the Lord of all, but he's the Lord of his people. He's the Lord of his people. We're not our own. Or we would be the Lord. I would be my own Lord. But we all have one Lord. That's what's exciting. You see what I'm talking about? That's why we come as one body. We have one spirit. We have one hope. And we all have one Lord and it ain't me and it ain't you. It ain't me and it ain't you. We're not our own. Because we've been redeemed and we've been bought by His blood according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 20. He died and He rose again from the dead so that He could be Lord of both the dead and the, life, the living. He's the Lord. He is the Lord. And the church needs to realize that it's, we're not our own, but we're His. He owns us. 
Amen. Amen. You can't be saved, if I can use that term, and be your own Lord. You can't be bought with a price and be your own. You can't do it if you're bought by the blood of Jesus. He owns you because it was His blood. He owns me. He owns me. Well, that's, that's not quite as exciting as getting out of hell. Submitting ourselves to His, his ownership. It says, Lord, we used to sing that old chorus. I don't know if anybody remembers it. I'm yours, Lord. I'm your something to the effect that whatever you want, everything I've got, whatever you want or whatever, I'm yours, Lord. Anybody remember that old song? I don't remember. We used to sing that until he wanted something. <laughs> he said, okay, since you're mine, here's what I want. No! No, no, God, no, no, don't, no, 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 no. I just, I just meant that was a good song we sang on Sunday, that, that I'm yours, Lord. No, 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 no. The church has to come to the recognition. The church has to be unified in the fact that it's not us, and we don't have church the way we want to have church. We don't live the way we want to live, but everything about us spiritually is because of His ownership. He's the head. He purchased the church, and we're a part of that. He died and rose again. And so, therefore, he owns it. You know, I, I can give an offering, but I never shed no blood. Amen. I can do some work, but it ain't mine. I don't own the church. I had a guy ask me the other day. He said, uh, he said, how much is your church in debt? And I said, we ain't in debt. Man. I said, we don't have no debt. We're, we're debt free. He said, well, well, that's pretty good for you. I said, it's pretty good for all of us. And he said, he said, well, that's your church. I said, ain't my church. <laughs> he said, well, I'll bet your name's on it. I don't know what he was trying to get me to say. But, you know, I said, ain't got my name on it. I said, the only thing my name's on is the sign. It's just because it identifies me as the pastor of the church. He said, yeah, but he said, your name's probably on the deed of that church, isn't it? I said, my name ain't on the deed of this church. He said, well, how come? And I said, because it ain't my church. He said, but you started it. I said, I ain't got nothing to do with it. I said, we've got a, we've got a system that, that it's, it's the church is owned by the church. The building is owned by the church and signed for by the, the, the board. And, and, and I said, and that can revolve and change. But I said, that, that way, I said, he said, well, you could just sell it and retire. I said, I can't sell this church and retire. I said, in fact, it's even built in. It says nobody could ever profit into the selling of this church. If we sold this church for a million dollars, I don't get a dime of it. Nobody else gets a dime of it. If we disband, I don't know why I'm saying all this, but it's, it fits in here. <laughs> if we disband and sell the church and the building and Mercy Hospital wants to buy it, and they come up and say, we'll give you a million bucks, there ain't nobody in this room gets a million bucks. There ain't nobody gets a dime from it. It all goes back into different ministries of the United Pentecostal Church because it's not my church. It's not my church. I don't own it. He owns it. He owns the church. He, not only the building, but he owns us as his body because the head tells, owns the body. Without the head, the body will die. And so the, the head takes care of the body. And so he owns the body. You know when you really get out, out of whack and you go to the doctor to find out what's wrong is when your head tells your right hand to move and your left hand does. And your head says, right hand, scratch your ear, and your foot comes up. That's when you start thinking, there's something wrong with me. Because the head tells the body what to do. And when the head owns the body, and he owns it, and he tells it what to do, it should respond. So it takes me to my last and final point. The head... The one Lord, He not only owns it, but He has authority. He has authority. He has authority. Amen. You know, when, when we realize that the Lord has authority, then what it does is it makes us realize we're subject to Him. We're subject to Him. Now, now stay with me on this. 
Because if, if he's, the, if we say, that's why we can come in here and, and, and we don't hear people pray this a lot like we used to hear people. But people used to come to church and pray, have your way, Lord. Instead of giving him a list, we used to just, we used to just say, Lord, have your way. Have your way. Let, you might remember how we, we just say, let's just have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. You know why we can say that? Because it's not like we're giving him permission. We're just acknowledging the fact that he's our Lord. And he has ownership, but we're also recognizing his authority to do with what he wants to do inside his body. Because it's his body, and we are acknowledging his ownership and his authority. So you know what the good part about this is? Here's the, here's the good part. This is not negative. This is, this, is, this is 100% positive. We're subject to him. We're subject to his guidance. Steps of a good man are ordered of God. You think the head's going to send the body someplace that's going to destroy it? You think the Lord, if my hand, if I'm his finger, do you think he's just going to find a... a, a meat grinder and say, let's just stick your finger down in there and see what that does. He ain't going to do that. Would you do that? You wouldn't stick your finger in a... I think I'll just go out there and slam my finger in a car door just see if it hurts as bad as everybody says it does. Well, there'd be something wrong with your head. Am I right? You're not going to do that. So, what, so I, I relax and I can rejoice in the fact that I am subject... To his guidance. He's not going to lead me wrong. He's not going to take me someplace I don't want to go. It's sin that takes you where you don't want to go. But when you follow the Lord, when you're under his authority and his guidance, he's not going to send you someplace that's going to destroy you, but he's going to send you places that will make you better. You show me any strong person, and they've had to go through some stuff. They've had to go through some stuff. But the Bible teaches us that the Lord will always be there. He promised us. We talked about it last week. He promised us. That's the first concept we learn as Christians. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that His grace is always sufficient. And He will be there with us no matter what we go through. Sometimes to get where my head wants to go, my feet have to walk to where my feet don't understand why they got to walk that much. But it's to get me to where I'm supposed to go. So, his guidance, we're subject to his guidance. He's, he's got us, he's leading us, he's, he's got Lead us and guide us, God. Our conscience is subject to his precepts. Our hearts are subject to his love. Amen. It ain't bad having the Lord for your Lord. I said, it ain't bad having the Lord for your Lord. It ain't bad having the Lord for your Lord. But what's really bad is when you try to let Him be the Lord, but you tell Him how to be the Lord. Lord, you can be my Lord, but here's how you're going to do it. And, and, and Paul is painting a beautiful picture of the church. He said that we should walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called. We have been called out of darkness into this marvelous light. We've been called to be ambassadors, ambassadors of Christ. And we're part of the body that's that ambassador. And there's just one body. There's not two churches here. Thank God. Amen. There's, 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 not, two, there's not one group that is saying... I, I've got the spirit that I want to know the Lord, and the other is, is like, I don't, you know, no, we got one spirit. We just want the Lord to be dominant. We just want the Lord. We just want to know the Lord. Amen. 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 And we're excited. We should always be excited. I remember the first time that I, as an adult, when I got back in church, I was in church as a kid, and I got out at about 16 and got back in at 19. But, but after Sister Morris and I got married, and I acknowledged my call to preach. My pastor let me be the song leader. And I remember the first time that I ever shouted, the first time I ever danced and shouted in church as an adult was we were singing that song, When the Redeemed Are Gathering In. 
I was 20 years old. I had been 45 years ago, and I still remember. I remember when we sang that chorus that then the Savior will give orders to prepare the banquet board. We'll hear his invitation, come ye blessed of the Lord. Man, something got all over me, and I got so excited about going to heaven that I couldn't help it. I began to dance and shout. There was an emotion that came up from the hope of my calling, and I've been excited about going to heaven. I, I just, I'm going to be honest with you. When I'm listening to songs, and they're talking about people are dying and how rough life is, and I just turn that off. Give me a heaven-going song. Yeah. Give me a song about my hope. I don't need to hear about mama used to pray and all that. Dear Lord, let me talk about going to heaven. Tell me about those streets of gold. Hey, I don't need to hear about how rough life is. I know how rough life can be down here. You know what I need to hear about? Come up a little closer. Amen. What's that sound I hear? Is that the sound of a trumpet? I need to know that Jesus is coming, that I've got a way out of here. I've got a better place. And that's what ought to be our emotional drive. If we can't get excited about going to heaven, then what in the world are we doing? Amen. Amen. I just don't want to go to hell. And I ain't planning on going. Amen. And we got one Lord. And he's in control. And he's guiding us. And he's giving us precepts. And he's got a love that's unsurpassable. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Why don't we stand tonight and just raise our hands and, and love the Lord?